Hello, Keith Geyser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're working our way through the Gospel according to Luke, and we're already coming toward the end of the book. We're into the passion narrative of our Lord Jesus. In other words, we're leading up to his sufferings and his death on the cross, as well as the resurrection and ascension. And we're in Luke chapter 22 today, starting at verse 7, Luke 22 and verse 7, the Gospel according to Luke 22 and 7. And in Luke's Life of Christ, we come to the talk of preparation for the last Passover that our Lord would celebrate prior to going to the cross. Luke 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Passover was and is a very important holiday to the Jewish people. It's kind of like Thanksgiving and Christmas and Independence Day all rolled into one. There's an element of theology to it that this is the day historically when Israel commemorates the national redemption that was accomplished for them as they were bought out of the slavery in Egypt. They were saved from the wrath that was falling on Egypt, the death of the firstborn, and as the Lord's firstborn, that's how he described Israel, the nation. They were his chosen people, his son. Israel is my son, my firstborn, he told Pharaoh. So they were redeemed from that death that was falling on Egypt. What's more, the Lord not only redeemed them from that death by blood, the blood of a lamb whose blood was shed, that innocent victim, in other words, was a substitute for the people. Instead of the people dying, the lamb died. And they applied the blood to the exterior of their house on the doorposts and the lintel above the door to symbolize their faith in that blood, that someone else had died for them. The penalty of death had been carried out on another. And, of course, the Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. It says the wages of sin is death. We know that death came into the world through sin. Death, not only physical death, but spiritual death, being separated from God, not knowing God, being in darkness, being alienated in our minds, and at enmity with God. These are all ways the Bible describes that condition of spiritual death, which we're all in because we're all sinners. Until we come to know the Redeemer, until we have that redemption applied to us, the death of Christ on the cross for us, we don't know the Lord in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7 says. And 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, looks back to this feast and calls Christ our Passover. So the believer looks back and says, yes, he was the redeemer for that nation of Israel. They were saved from the wrath falling on Egypt at that time. What's more, God saved them the next day as they went through the Red Sea and they were saved from the power of Egypt, from that slavery and bondage that they were in. And likewise, we've been saved from the dominion of sin, Romans 6 says, now to walk in newness of life, now to have a new master, even the Lord, who has put his spirit into believers to begin sanctifying us, to prepare us for heaven and also conform us to the image of his son. And that entails becoming morally and spiritually like Christ. Of course, the moment we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus said in John 5, 24, we pass from death unto life. We go from being dead in trespasses and sins, like Ephesians 2, 1 says, to being quickened or regenerated, to be given new life when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look and live is the message of the Bible. Look to the Lord Jesus and he can save you because he's offered the right payment on the cross and through his resurrection, that payment can be applied to our account, that eternal life that Jesus has purchased, and he becomes our Lord and our God when we confess our sin and ask him to save us. Now, they looked back theologically on that redemption for the nation, but it was also where they looked at the birth of their nation, where they looked at what be began as a, a group of families in Egypt at the end of Genesis when 
when through the auspices of Joseph, who was then the supreme ruler of the land under the Pharaoh, he was the prime minister, we might say, and Joseph brought his brethren and their kinsfolk down, and he provided for them in the land of Goshen. And they remained in that land, and Exodus tells the tale in the early chapters of how they were eventually enslaved because the Egyptians began to fear them. So prosperous and numerous they became that the Egyptians in, enslaved them in the fear that they'd be a fifth column within the society. In other words, they would be those ready to collaborate with Egypt's enemies in case of attack. And so the same way the United States in the 1940s grew afraid of Japanese Americans, the so-called Nisei, the second generation, the children of immigrants who were loyal Americans. And yet, because we were at war with Japan, there were people in our government who thought uh, these folks are a security risk and they're a danger to the country. And unfortunately, they rounded them up and put them in these concentration camp type situations. And it was a, a time of great suffering for those people albeit not nearly as bad as what the Germans did to the Jews, the Nazi Germans in uh, the Second World War, and other countries had their share of atrocities as well. But it just shows us how there can be this psychology, this thinking that someone is a potential threat to us politically or physically, and so we're going to get them before they can get us. In fact, uh, some other Nisei who were allowed to join the United States Armed Forces became among the most decorated soldiers of the Second World War. So they proved their loyalty and uh, the fact that many of these, uh, uh, these people, when they were released from captivity after the war, they went back to being what they had been before, honest American citizens who built up this country. And some of them later served high up in government as senators and congressmen in different positions like that. And many others became teachers and academics and people that made a positive contribution to society. So it showed in America's history that the threat was unfounded, that the, the fears were groundless, and even our government has had to apologize for what they did back then. Well, Egypt did the same thing, and that was pretty much par for the course in the ancient world, that to enslave another people didn't make anybody blink. But the Lord said, let my people go, and the Lord redeemed them. And that's what they remembered on Passover. This is our national identity. We are the people of the Lord because the Lord has redeemed us. Now, the church, in similar fashion, we look back to Christ, our Passover, and we say we are the people of the Lord. We're a holy nation, as First Peter 2 calls us, not a nation with an earthly government, not a nation with earthly citizenship. Philippians 3 says, for our citizenship is in heaven from whence we wait for the Savior who will transform the bodies of our humiliation into bodies like unto his glorious body. So Christians, we may be citizens of America or Great Britain or Canada or some other country of the world, but our chief citizenship is the spiritual one. We say we must obey God rather than man. Now, normally obeying God entails being a good citizen. And the Lord told his people, as we've seen in Luke, to pay their taxes uh, he told them to show proper honor and respect, and the epistles unpack that and say that we should pray for our leaders and the powers that be, especially that they would come to a knowledge of the truth, especially that they'd come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And First Timothy 2 certainly gives us that. But Romans 13 tells us that the powers that be are ordained of God. God raises up human government and raises up specific regimes. Daniel 4 says he raises up the lowest of men and puts them over the kingdoms. And so this is what the Lord often does for his purposes. He lets different ones come to power, and some may, from our vantage point, be better rulers than others, but none of them is able to thwart the will of God, and all of them, one way or another, are going to be used in God's purposes. God may allow them to go on for a time, doing unjust things as he would allow them to unjustly deliver up his son to be crucified and to put him on that cross. But we see that it was God's purpose, that God allowed that evil to transpire, that he might do something greater, that he might make the Lord Jesus our Passover, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as John 1 29 says of him. That in other words, we go back and we look to the Christ and we say, this is where 
Passover happened for us, that because the Lord endured our wrath, the righteous anger of God against our sin, the punishment we should have received, the Lord took our guilt and took our penalty, the punishment we deserved, and he suffered all of that on the cross of Calvary in the three dark hours that man was not permitted to see. And the Lord said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God, acting as the righteous judge of the universe, did not have mercy on his son in that moment. He laid on him the iniquity of us all, as Isaiah 53 says. And First Peter 2 describes it, saying he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. One of our hymns says, all thy sins were laid upon him. Jesus bore them on the tree. God, who knew them, laid them on him, and believing, thou art free. Yes, if we believe that, that the Lord Jesus loved me and gave himself for me, that he died in my place, that it was for my sins that he endured this. And I don't want to go on independently of him and independently of his will. I want to bow and acknowledge him as my Lord and my God and to thank him for saving me and receive him as my Lord and Savior. He says, I shall be saved. And then I can say, Christ, my Passover, has been sacrificed for me. Well, coming to this day of Passover, the Lord, as a devout Jew, a man born under the law, as Galatians 4.4 4 reminds us, he sent Peter and John to prepare the Passover. There were certain practical things that had to be done in order to prepare that Seder meal that they were going to enjoy. And so he said, go prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. But they asked him quite naturally in verse 9, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house in which he enters. So already you see the Lord has made preparation. They've just got to go and put the final touches on the preparation. And this really is a good picture of any kind of service for the Lord, that we have to get over ourselves and realize we're not the ones doing it. It is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2 says. And we are the instruments that God uses. He is the true vine, John 15 says, and we are the branches. And if we abide in him, we bear much fruit. So that energy source from the vine flows through the branches, and that's what produces the fruit. He said, without me, ye can do nothing in that same passage in John 15. And we really see it here, that they're just going, putting the finishing touches on the work that the Lord has already prepared for them. And so uh, we see we are in a collaborative work with the Lord. Yes, we serve the Lord. Yes, we obey the word of God. That's what we ought to do as believers, at least, if we love him, keep his commandments. He told them in the upper room in John. Um, but here we see just a little picture of this, that they go and the Lord has already had preparation. Now, it's often been noted that this is an uncommon thing to enter the city and see a man carrying a pitcher of water. That normally would have been something the ladies would have done. But whether this man's wife was ill or whether he was a single man or what the circumstance was, we are not told. But here he was coming along at just the right moment. And this was a providence of God, something that the Lord knew in his foreknowledge and also provided for here that they would meet this man and he would lead them to the house uh, where they were to go, go into whatever, follow him into the house where he enters, he says. Verse 11, then you'll say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there, make ready. And so we see the Lord's already got everything set up for them and he already knows what they're going to encounter before they get there. And that gives us great confidence when we go through our lives and we say, you know, I don't know what's going to happen later today, much less tomorrow. I don't know what next year is going to be like. When we look back at last year, a lot of us would say, well, I didn't see that pandemic coming. Or even if I thought there might be a virus that would spread around the world, I didn't perceive that it would have a lot of the practical disruption that it did where I live or that it brought to our lives. And pretty much everybody around the world in some way or another was touched by it and continues to be in some countries more than others. So these are things that we can't foresee. Of course, there are wars that break out all the time. Uh, there are economic downturns. There are upturns. There are all sorts of fluctuating things on this planet. 
and we say, how can I go forth to serve the Lord, not knowing what I'm going to encounter? But the Lord says, no, I know everything. I know the end from the beginning. He is the all-wise God. He is truly omniscient. He knows everything. And so we can go forth with the confidence saying, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow, as an old chorus says. I have to follow the Lord. Just follow the Lord. Trust him. He knows the way. He will lead us. As Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct or make straight your paths. So that's a great principle of the word of God and we see it here. And of course, verse 13 is confirmation. So they went and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the Passover. Now the Lord tells us a lot of things about the future. We've seen some of those in Luke 21 about the Lord talking about the last days and what will happen in this world before the second coming. And I can tell you what the Lord Jesus told us about the future, whether it was the near future in his times or whether it's the extended future, the Lord Jesus is never wrong. He never has been wrong and he never shall be wrong because he is the very embodiment of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And he is one who, when he tells us something, we can take that to the bank, so to speak. We can put our confidence in it because the Lord knows what's going to happen. And that gives us great confidence, not just that he knows what's going to happen, but that he's working in the world to accomplish his purposes. As Ephesians 1.11 says, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. So may we have great confidence as we serve him, that he's in control, that he knows, and that he can guide us if we're listening, if we're looking to him. He'll show us the way. He'll open and close the right and wrong doors, respectively, and we will know his power as he uses us to serve him. Thanks be to God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.